Why don't you introduce yourself and right. talk about who you are, a little bit of your background and what you do. Okay. Uh, my name is Lou Mars and I'm a professional musician, recording artist, author. Um, I've been in the business more years than I'd like to admit. We'll just say 30 plus, let's do that. I've had the opportunity to tour this great country of ours once in the last three decades. So I've seen a lot happen over the years. Currently, uh, I have a book coming out in less than 30 days that talks about some of that. Um, a world record opportunity coming up. The, this uh, should actually be out July 1st, I think. So you can, Yeah, you the pre-order, pre-order, which is the e-version, the hardcover will be out before Christmas. And uh, the way it works is hardcover is available before paperback because they want you to pay more money <laughs> for the same book. <laughs> Gotta love the business. <laughs> so yes. Um, and you, so you've been in music for most of your life, right? Pretty much all of it. Um, I started in a school program. I wanted to play trumpet. I saw this guy one night playing trumpet with reflector mirror sunglasses. I'll never forget, I was 10 years old. I'd already had piano lessons for two years. That was a disaster. It wasn't because of the piano, it was the teacher. So always, if you, if you don't match up with an instrument, check your instructor. It makes a huge difference. Don't give up. Or try a different instrument after that. I just want to get that out there. I revisited the piano years later, and I love it now. However, at that time, that wasn't the case. But I saw this trumpet player. He was up there playing, and I'm like, man, i got to play trumpet. So I, next day, I went into the school program and said, I want to play trumpet. And they go, we're all out of trumpets. <laughs> you can't play trumpet. But we have a drum. So I'm picturing this big drum set. I'm like, yes, I'll do drums. The next thing I know, I'm playing Hava Nagila on a bass drum. <laughs> That's a true story. That was the first song I ever played. And I'm like, can I at least play on a snare? And they said, you have to work your way up to the snare. You've got to play for a year. So fast forward, at age 13, I was competing on the drums at the Reno Jazz Festival. I won second world uh, that particular event. And then throughout high school, I was treated like a varsity football player. I was competing for the school. They would send me off just to compete. And in Bret Hart Junior High, to this day, their trophy case, there's a picture of me with a music letter they created with the principal um, because of winning competitions. So the bug had bitten. It was on drums. That was all drums at that time. So bands followed quickly. I miss the garage band. I think there should be more. I miss garages. What happened to the garage? What happened to the corner pub that's now a coffee shop? You know, Those were places that bands got started. And so um, it's a different game now uh, with the internet and so forth. But back then, you got started in a garage. And uh, I was in those garages. And at age 19, I went on my first tour in an old school bus. And there's a, an old ad I'll never forget by a credit card company. And they show a kid watching his friends go off to college. And uh, they're saying, you know, price of college this, price of that. But then they show the kid with a guitar case. And he's getting on the old bus with his buddies to go and hit the road. And they go, priceless. <laughs> and that's exactly how it was for me. You're a multi-instrumentalist now. But you said yeah. drums is kind of the, what, what got you going in the beginning. What, how, is, yeah. how has drums played a role in your, in your life? Drums was huge. Drums, percussion in general, saved my life. And that's not an understatement. And I will follow that with this. Back in the day when I started playing, there was no such thing as autism yet. But they had a thing. They knew, uh, they called it hyperactivity. I was a kid who couldn't sit still in class. I acted out. I seemed to know the information in the classroom already without being taught it. It was weird. I just knew the answers. So I could screw off and then pass the final exam. And they just didn't understand that. But that created a monster. That means I could really just do anything, tell jokes. I couldn't stop tapping. So they wanted to put me on a drug called Ritalin. And uh, my mother was wise enough to say no. And thank God. And instead, they got me a drum set. And I beat the heck out of the thing. As a matter of fact, the first day I got it, I was so hyper and excited, I poked holes in the bass drum head. <laughs> I just poked holes. And they're like, they're like, what are you doing? That's how crazy. So most people would have said, take that away. No, they let me keep going. Those drums gave me an output for all the energy, all the sound, and the excitement. And I can't imagine if I were out today if that would have been possible or happened. Yeah, so definitely <clears throat> that way to, to get out with that energy and the it's huge. way to focus it, right? I, we give Johnny a big gulp, and we wonder why he's bouncing off the walls or acting strange. Uh, we never look at 
Maybe it's the diet. Maybe it doesn't have a place to output that energy. Folks, I mean, if you're listening to this or watching this right now and you've got a child in your house that is being told that is difficult or different or hard to control, you should seriously consider getting them on an instrument, in my opinion. Whether, uh, the great ones to start, drums and piano. They're both in the percussion family, actually, and they're both fantastic foundations of everything. If you know how to play the drums, you know those counts, you know those rhythms, it's going to roll in, even if you don't decide you don't like the drums, it's going to roll into any other instrument appropriately to help you perform in the future, and specifically writing, which I'm a huge fan of. Don't play everyone else's music. I mean, get inspired, but write your own stuff. You're going to become a painter. You don't paint by number your whole life. You've, at some point, you go, I'm going to paint a picture. You know, Paint outside the lines, scribble, whatever makes you happy. I totally agree. Drums is definitely a, a great fundamental instrument to learn and start on. Oh, and, yeah, you're a fantastic drummer. So, you know, <laughs> oh, um, and as are you from everything I've seen. I've actually haven't seen, gotten to play live with you. No, we've got to do we'll live. Do inter soon. Live interaction would be sick. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I have, I'd be all for it. Uh, you, you, you've definitely shown that, that focus that you're talking about, um, especially in the things that, that you've accomplished. Um, just looking at your website, I mean, it kind of almost reads like an Oliver Stone movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, let, let me just Never list up a couple things here. Go ahead. I'll so, take a sip of the Joe here. Go ahead. <clears throat> 2008, you won the Dixon Drums National Competition, drum off. That is correct. Yeah. And through that, got featured in the uh, Drum Your Way to Hollywood and subsequent How to Be a Great Drummer documentaries. Well, and prior to that, it was a that came from a reality show that I had the director from ZZ Top or the producer, well, not director, the producer from ZZ Top, the Who, Us Festival. Several of them, uh, Winsky, famous recorder who did some of the Beatles stuff, sitting about 10 feet, 20 feet away from me like you did, and then they had to go play, live on TV. And the, the biggest moment of all of my career probably that happened at that moment was the Michael, uh, oh, I'm so angry, I can't remember, Michael, oh, it's, it's, I'll look it up. He was there who worked with Keith Moon while he was alive. And uh, they were asking me who I thought I played like, and I was mentioning Gene Krupa. And he goes, you know who you remind me of? It's on the clip. You remind me of Keith Moon. And I was like, well, I just got knighted. <laughs> you know, was the, just got knighted. So yeah, but keep going, what you were saying. Oh yeah, no, great, Keith, Keith Moon's awesome. It was a moment, flashback. Yes. I do that, flashback. <laughs> <laughs> well, so many memories I can imagine. You're bringing them up. <laughs> and, so that's 2008, 2010 is when you went for the Guinness Book World Record, right? For longest yeah. drummer. Yeah. Five days, 108.5 hours. Five so. days, four nights, second at the time. Many thought it was it should have been the first because it was the most aggressive uh, performance and most people to ever watch. Fifty-four something, fifty-four thousand online streamed it, which had never been done. And the police department in Seattle were watching it on their monitors in their vehicles. It was reported, and CBS and NBC covered it live in a small screen. Uh, for quite, you know, for all most of the period, so it was big stuff. Yeah, so one of those NBC clips. Yeah, they like, had it yeah. going. Uh, <clears throat> so you are currently one of four drummers worldwide, worldwide that holds a record of. You say they put that mark at 100 hours, so the first, yeah. only the four that could go over 100 hours. Yeah, there's only four that have actually gone over 100 hours. It's like the 100 hour club. And that's the marker that we have all decided that whether you have a record or not, if you can do that, there's something special about that. It's almost like the four-minute mile back in the day. You know, if you could get past that mark, and it's there's no doubt that is uh, that is a scary mark. What did it? I saw that you, some of your training that that you went through in some of those clips and. <clears throat> I can only imagine what kind of endurance and, and stamina it took. What, what yeah. you know, they're obviously working out, and, and I heard you had a nutrition counselor, right? Or Matter of fact, the, the, it, my team was amazing. Uh, the, the man who was behind my nutrition is famous now, Rob Wolf, who wrote the uh, paleo, uh, part of the paleo movement. He's got a book that was in the New York top seller, and he was my personal nutrition uh, a nutritionist. And in addition, you'll see him, if you watch the documentary, he gives a, just a, a mind-blowing finale speech at the end of it. And that, uh, that's the documentary you're talking about on the record? 
on the uh, marathon drumming record. He's on that. That's called Beat Five. Right? Beat Five. Yeah, if you ever get a chance, just the way he sums up the event is one of my favorite moments. Uh, he talks about, you know, what it's like to lose but win in that statement. But he was, yeah, great guy. He was my personal coach out of the team I had. And there's another clip you can see if you look it up. Uh, that whole team, uh, we had a worldwide interview like five days later, and they all speak with me in a circle. And that's almost even more fascinating, I think, because you get to hear from I feel the people that really did the record, which were the people behind me. And what, what did I mean? How what did they advise to you? Like what? How the heck did you did you accomplish that? I mean, you have your, your sheer willpower. I'm, I'm assuming was a big part, yeah. big part of it. But what else did you have to do? That maybe you thought may have been surprising in your training. Um, you hit it first off. What you don't realize is how much heart it is more than the physical. And that's something you can't prepare for. Um, and it catches you off guard. Desire. When you are in that much pain, when you're going in day three or four, and your wrists are so swollen and taped, and they thought this one was fractured because it had been fractured before. They, at the time, it was reported on the news I was playing on a broken arm. But it, it felt like it. This thumb was backwards. My legs were mangled. You're a mess. Um, but you're still playing because you want it that bad. That's, and part of it was, you know, you didn't see what I saw when you're watching that. I'm looking out and there's kids on the floor, sitting on the floor, air drumming. And you, you look at that, you're just like, ah, oh, I can't stop. You know, I, I got to keep going. You know, the kid's like, let me go, go, he's got a shirt. You know, your name's on it. it. Makes me a little wet to think about that. But, you know, that was part of it. Uh, the other thing, in the middle of the night, we had a big screen on the right side of the wall. It was the first time it had ever been done. And we had live streaming with people who could chat with me. They couldn't, they, I couldn't, I could respond, you know, by vocally, because I was playing. They could hear me on the mics. So what was really amazing was that my hardest time was three in the morning. Three, something about three in the morning, and I've read about that from several people. Three in the morning, that would hit, and that's when weird stuff would happen, too. Um, but the Japanese would come on at three in the morning, because it was their afternoon. And they would go, you know, they, I'd see all this scratch, which I couldn't read in their language. And then it'd be like... Keep going, <laughs> you know, like, a, you're awesome in English. Just one little two words, and that's all I needed. I could see all the Japanese, Japanese, and awesome, <laughs> rock and roll, <laughs> you know. And it was just enough to be like, yeah, they're, you know, the people are still there. That's what keeps you going. And so you don't, don't underestimate the power of other people um, is what that is. I mean, you've got yourself first, but it is amazing that that eight-year-old can get you past our 108. You know, maybe a little bit more uh, just by looking out there. So that's a big part of it. And you say you hit those, those weird overnight moments and weird things would happen. Would yeah. you give us some examples? Well, the, the, all of us, uh, the four drummers that have hit over the 100-hour mark have one thing in common. Some will talk about it, some won't. And most of us have not talked about it because it affects our press. It's going to be in my book, uh, Beat Alive. It, it's, uh, it is in my book. You just haven't seen it yet. And in, in there, I do describe, I do go into the dark areas that the other drummers have not talked about, except briefly in interviews. And that is, there seems to be another dimension. You asked about my preparation. Part of my preparation prior to this event, I met and spoke with a B-52 pilot, where they would train these guys in World War II about sleep deprivation, because that was the torture. And he was explaining to me, you are getting ready to put yourself into torture. This is how they tortured prisoners. And they would prep our, our warriors with that preparation of what to expect. And the hallucinations that come with it, or are they? That's the big question. You know, do you actually leave your body? Is that possible? You know, science doesn't know a lot of that. All of the drummers in common, we all had out-of-body experiences. Uh, we all had points where we left, and we looked down, and we saw ourselves playing. I went into dimensions of different time, and it'll sound crazy. You can read the details about it, but I go into specific details. It was very real. At one point, I was talking in another place with people that were helping me. And they're telling me what to do, what's going on there. Repaired my arm. It's strange stuff. Fixed my arm, which was very strange because it was diagnosed as broken. I came back and it was fixed. How did that happen? I mean, I saw them do it right in front of me. And they go, we got another person in your body right now playing. You rest. You're going to rest for three hours and then go back and you're going to be fresh. So next thing I know, uh, water's going down my eyes. I hear a five, four, Luke, come on. And I came back, and I was back. 
and I hit. And I felt great. My arm was back, and they're like, he's back. I tore the tape off my arms. They're like, what are you doing? And I started hammering away. I played hard like that for another six hours because I was fresh. Wow. Weird stuff. I'm not the only drummer that reported that. And there is another dimension, another place uh, that it's possible to get to. People talk about near-death experiences. I don't think you have to be dead to get there. That's my point. So where do you, how, how did you, so was going through that in a way kind of inspiring to help keep you going? Like how do you, I, I picture, you know, uh, you know, what's hour 30? Like, I try, I play a four hour show on drums and I'm jello. Like, I, so how, yeah. Are you, are you, how do you find a way to recharge yourself? And, and I think that's part of what your body is doing at that point. Um, the science side of what I just probably stated would be that your body is, is protecting itself by saving yourself. You're leaving your body for the pain. The pain is so poor, it's excruciating. Now, the weird thing is, how are we still playing while we're not there? That's what's bizarre. I went back and watched the tapes, and I know exactly when I left, and I know when I came back. You could see it in my face. You could see I'm not there. I also noticed that person during that time wasn't playing like I play. So it almost matches that someone else is in that body that didn't know how to play. It was trippy like that. Um, so protection, perhaps. The other part of it was it was just a matter of, um, you know, you, 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 gosh, how do I put it? I mean, you, you hit on it. The f one of the most difficult periods was day one. The majority of drummers that have gone after this event uh, usually don't make it to 70. That's been the point. That was the hardest for, gosh, three decades. 70 hours. Yeah. 70 hours was the max. Um, it started out at 30 in the first record. The second one was Kunto, set it at 76. For years, it never got past 100. It didn't get past 100 until the year before I went after it. So if I had played... The year prior, which was a record that was still being approved, which eventually found to be false, so I would have been first, that person got disqualified. So I would have had the record. I was the, the, the other record was 103 uh, by an Australian gentleman. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting, the, the aggressiveness that happened there. 70 hours to get to that point, I, the, the nuts were falling out of the bottom of my snare drum. I was hitting so hard. I, the entire event, I broke over, I think the report was 70-something sticks. Wow. Yeah. That was, so I was hitting. These are five Bs, five As for you drummers out there. You know, those aren't toothpicks. And um, I didn't think I was going to make it. I just shut down, and then the next thing you know, I came back. And then I had people going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And I listened to them. And at one point, I was like, they're going, this point, if you just finish, you're going to win. It was interesting, you know, just goes hard. Because at one point we were talking strategy and my, my team was going, slow down, it's a marathon. But the voices in the other place were going, don't slow down, play harder. You'll make a bigger impact if you keep playing hard because that's what people want to see. So I did, I came back and I played harder. My team was getting pissed. There's a great picture of Rob Wolf. I'll have to share at some point with you where he's in my face like a coach and a baseball team mad at his player, and I'm just sitting here almost out of it, and he's just like, hat down, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Love that shot. And uh, that pretty much sums up what happened. I didn't listen, and the rest was history, and uh, it, it made one of the biggest drum, to this day, it's one of the most spoken about versions of that record ever. Part of the reason I've been invited to come back and do it again with these other guys. So, th so you were in the four... Uh, or I guess the other other three around the world that, that currently yep. have uh, a record of over 100 hours. You guys got something planned for the future? It will be epic. Uh, the location would be Portugal. And for the first time ever in the history of modern drumming, four drummers that are uh, lettered, so to speak, as a record fact, holders. Yes, will be playing together at the same time shooting for a combined record, which it subsequently could come out to an individual record on top of that. So it's, it's amazing. So for these other countries that look at power drumming as a major feat, and it's a big thing, unlike America, it's not really there yet, but Japan, Indonesia, uh, Spain, drumming is huge, especially power drumming. They look at us as like superior athletes. And it, you know, technically it is. The athleticism behind this is amazing. Yeah. I, I've, I've heard uh, that... Uh, a 90-minute 
show on drums is equivalent to a soccer game, like run a two or three oh, hour soccer game. There are old reports that were done in the late '80s and early '90s where they put, uh, you know, testing modules on drummers and were testing them out, and they had them above an NFL pro uh, football player. One night of play was more energy and more difficult. So yeah, we're moving every limb. And we don't stop between plays. You know, as like these guys do, we're going on and on all night long. So absolutely. Now, here's a here's a thought. Try to stand in one place for five days. Just stand there. Yeah. Not easy. Okay. Now try to walk. It's in place. Now try to move all four limbs for five days. Oh wait a minute. It has to be to a certain beat in a a recognizable way to a song. Yeah, yeah. That that I think was probably one of the most craziest things I'd learned. Um, checking out the event is I'm, I'm picturing you at least just keep a, the, the ride symbol just going. Just touch it. That's what the drummer before me did. Yeah. Uh, which got eventually but that's disqualified. that's not the case, right? No, we, uh, the drummers that are currently now in it, it was that way at the beginning, but since my event, that's kind of what changed that. I was the first drummer to play it all the way through because I followed the rules. The rules state you cannot repeat a song within a four-hour period. That's one. But songs have to be recognizable. Your performance has to be recognizable along with that song. A song has to start with the drums within 30 seconds and end with the drums within 30 seconds. So you can't play Stairway to Heaven and sit there and then jump in yeah. at the two-minute mark. Yeah. So that means that at a maximum, you've got 30 seconds between every song, and that's it. Your only breaks is you're not allowed to defecate or urinate on the drum set. <laughs> you can eat and everything else if you can keep playing, which I did off my floor, Tom. I ate with okay. one hand, play with one hand, you know, some songs. Um, so, but you have to earn it. You have to play one full 60 minute hour to get a five minute break. And here's where the strategy comes in. You can accrue those breaks if you don't take it. So my longest break in five days was 45 minutes. And that was actually the biggest mistake we made. You might think, oh, it's, oh you had it easy. Did no. you cool down or something? I cooled down too much and they had a heck of a time trying to get me out of it. I, I was almost like in a coma. I, they finally shook me out and they were walking me toward the stage. I still remember this like yesterday. I remember just starting to come to and I looked ahead and I saw all this big stage and two drum sets and I'm like, I go, who's playing? That's what I remember. Who's playing? This looks like a great show. You know? And they're like, you are. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. And then they, they sat me up there and they can't prop you. So they dropped me and I've started falling back and the count went again. You have to start within the count, 30 seconds, go. And I hit it just right on the last count. Just got bang because there's judges there. Got back. It was a Michael Jackson song, Beat It. And just, uh, boom, do you turn it? <laughs> Autopilot. So yeah. you got to, you got to, that's part of the muscle memory that mm -hmm. we talk about. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was day three. I remember that. And um, part of rehearsing and practicing and part of the songs that I selected were ones that I just knew so well or heard on the radio so many times that I knew that when I was in that state, you could just play. Just pull it out, yeah. yeah, and that's how we do it. That's how we get on stage and do these things. And, and it's at just that much more of an extreme, that's all. And um, going after that 144, which was my original target, six days. 144. That number kept coming up in my mind. And I believe in that. When something keeps coming up and repeating to you, there's a reason for that. So I, I think I'm supposed to hit that 144. And I think I can. I actually think I'm stronger now than I was then. And especially mentally, because now I know. You know, when you've been somewhere that's strange, the first time you get there, you're like, this is really strange. But, you know, it's like being Alice in Wonderland. Well, now this time I'll go back and be like, I expect to see the caterpillar. I know the Cheshire cat will be there. I'll just say hello again. <laughs> I'm back. Nice to see you again. <laughs> now get me past day five. <laughs> Pro at this now. Yes, exactly. 144 hours. That is, that's a, almost like a new, a new uh, I mean, it's a whole new level of what you, you already went over 100. Yeah, but, I've, uh, I've cleared it. I, I think what the uh, difference will be this time. Um, one, uh, I'm old, <laughs> so uh, I'd like to show that. Uh, how, how old are you? Oh, I don't want to say that. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> I might feel old already. You can look up my stuff on the internet. You'll find out, and uh, hopefully, you'll think I look younger than I am. The uh, the idea is this: um, if I can inspire one child to pick up drumsticks, seeing me do this, and they start playing, it's a success. And there are so many people wanting to see me do it that, you know, I don't need to. I have no, I have, I'm good. But I know that I have a vehicle that I could do a lot of good with. And so it's kind of hard, it's hard to, to say no to that, to say that, 
you know, I'm just going to keep putting out albums. Or, I've got the book, you know. But the kids, and just like Carlos, who holds the record right now, Carlos Santos, he did it because he saw me play back in 2010. He's, you can ask him. It's in his interviews. He's invited me out. If, if I hadn't done that, he wouldn't be where he is right now. And by the way, he holds more records in the Guinness Book of World Records under drums than any other drummer ever has. Wow. He watched me as a youth. He contacted me. He asked me about it. And, and I watched him. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's fantastic. And if I were to lose to anybody in the group one, I hope it's Carlos. <laughs> that would be an honor. <laughs> so Carlos and, and, is, is that the one you were telling me about um, that you were actually helped coaching him too? For his? That was actually uh, Stephen Gall, a uh, Canadian. Fantastic. I was helping him when he did uh, the record in Canada, of course, talking to him, getting on the phone with his team and so forth. You know, part of it is, is um, you want to root somebody on. Uh, yes, there's a competitiveness. Did I want to see him break my 108 at the time? No. But at the same time, I did. Um, because if he did, it brought drumming to the forefront. And it did. Every time we did that stuff, I'm on Modern Drummers. Twitter follows like only 1,000 drummers. That's it. They have double-digit thousands of drummers who follow them. I'm one of those 1,000. So to, that's an honor. And it's things like Stephen Gall doing that that we get noticed and people start thinking about the drums again. And that's why, that's why I helped them. I was like, I knew the greater good, get the competition aside, plus I cared. You seen that guy hurt. There was a point where he was about ready to collapse. I remember it was around the 100 hour mark and he was going down and I talked to his team and I told them what to do. And they got him back up and going. It was awesome. So I, I knew I'd helped. It's come a full circle and, and you, uh that inspiration, um, sharing the inspiration, I think is, is a really uh, a really cool way that, that not only did you guys achieve this great feat, you know, an amazing test of, of will and endurance and, and musical craft, but you also were cooperating at the same time as you were competing. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Yeah, one of the things they said at the very end, I remember he was in his interview and they phoned me in live while he was on TV doing his thing. And I came in on the phone. I was congratulating him. And they're, you know, they're nudging me a little bit. How's it feel to be second, you know, at that point? Because he just passed mine in number. And I was like, uh, well, actually, you mean third. He pushed me down one more. And I said, you know, that's okay. You know, that's okay. Um, I'm still above the 100 hour mark, that magic mark. And I know what that meant. So as long as I'm in that club, if they raise that to 120, well, that's a new day. <laughs> you know, it becomes the 120 club. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just sit on the porch and think about the memories. <laughs> and what, what is, what, did you say the, uh, the, the maximum record now well, is? Right now, there's an unofficial. Um, so, so Carlos went after it and got a 133. And that's official. Kunto came back after. These guys keep coming after each other. I'm the only one that's sat out since 2010. Uh, Carlos and Steve, they've been going around and around and knocking each other out. So uh, Kunto just did it last or earlier this year. Earlier this year or the end of last year. End of last year, rolled over. He did it over the holiday season into the New Year's. And put up a 134, one hour more. <laughs> These guys do that all the time. They go, one more hour to knock them out of the books. But that is uh, not official yet. Still being reviewed. They have to Guinness reviews it. So gotcha. that could be the new record. We don't know yet. And that's part of the reason I was scheduled to do an individual in January. I didn't know Kunto was doing that. So as soon as I saw that, I was like, I held because I wanted to see where he finished and so forth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but I'll be back. Yeah, definitely keep me informed. Yeah, it's making my hand hurt just saying, you notice I just grabbed you, my hand. Yeah, it's you like, could. It's making my hand hurt just saying. Like, memories coming back. Yeah, I feel the sting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so shortly, um, Fairly soon after their 2010 record, um, you had your injury, right? Yeah, you know, first, what's interesting is my career was, uh, as a pro musician, I thought was dead. I was history. Washed up, old rocker. I mean, um, music had changed, I had changed, nothing was going on. So to roll back, it was the year prior when the national Dixon Drums Drum Your Way to Hollywood came out that at the time I was married and the wife... I know she must have sensed I was depressed, uh, which I am a lot often, but more than usual. She dropped this little thing in front of me, this international competition. And uh, I mean national, sorry, national. And uh, the, 
if you made it in the top six, you got a free snare drum, this really nice snare drum. I'm like, I'd like to have a snare drum. <laughs> so I had mothballed my drum kit. I had quit cold turkey on all music. I had so disappointed on the last tour. I was like, that's it. I'm done. Music's killing me. I've spent my whole life and I have nothing. So I, uh, I put it, uh, uh, I took all the old drums out of the boxes two weeks prior. They said, you got to do a two minute solo. You got to walk in to our shop, play one of our sets. And you put it in and everyone votes on it. Here was the problem. The event had already been six months comp. I was coming in on just 30 days left on the event. So to get the votes that I needed, the solo together, which I hadn't played in six years, was nuts. So I just went in and went berserk on a drum kit <laughs> in the place. And I ended up making the final six. And the next thing you know, I'm on Virgin Airlines. I got a limo picking me up in LA. Producers from New York and LA, these big time guys all meet down there and it's the cameras are on as soon as you get out. It's a reality show on the A&R channel on Comcast. Film the whole thing. And you only see clips of the short version now. And that becomes that that uh, video you talked about, how to be a great drummer. Parts of that were taken from that. Anyways, that relaunches my career. Next thing you know, I'm named, I get called up to be in a music video for Sharon Marie, uh, Warner Brothers recording artist for a gospel band. I guess they needed the white drummer, <laughs> so I, I came in. It gets, it gets nominated for a Grammy, and I'm in the, for the music video. I'm in that. Much of the music videos, if you watch that video, 50% of that video is on the drummer, which I happen to be. They wanted me to be like uh, this 50s drummer with sunglasses. Did it. So now I go, boom, I'm up another notch. Suddenly, I'm escalating in my career at a late time in life that I never had before. It was a huge comeback. Then the record. Then the record. So I'm like, what am I going to do next? Saw this guy, heard this guy knock out this record. I'm like, I could do that. I met with this CrossFit team, said, can you guys get me up to a point that I could do that? And they're like, well, you're out of shape. You drink too much. You eat junk. Yes. <laughs> and they did. I quit everything. I quit alcohol. I quit all the sugars. I went on a paleo diet strict. And they had me firmed up. They, I was running laps with kettlebells. Then I would play for an hour on the drums after working out every day. I had a team of six that were working on me, so I was fit. So that was that. And here's where the bad start part comes up that you just came up to. So everything's rocking. I'm getting ready to tour with uh, Dean Bruni out of, out of Italy, down from the LA band. I was talking to Nesta Ray about doing some drumming for her. VH1 uh, was talking to me about doing the record again in Vegas, and then we were going to hand out instruments and do a reality show on that. On my custom Harley, beautiful afternoon on a Friday. I'll never forget, uh, July 7th, 3.33 in the afternoon. I get around a turn, a, a, and what was weird, I normally don't go that way. There were so many circumstances. I got held up at the ATM. My password didn't work for some reason. I had to go in the bank. It delayed me by 60 minutes, 60 seconds. I got behind this car that was going really slow. So I took a right instead of a left. And it was that moment that a car came around that clover leaf and got into my lane and hit me head on. A 90 mile per hour impact. The life flight from Stanford showed up with my body back because they were told I was dead. They said it was a 90 mile per hour impact uh, motorcycle. You don't survive that. So they were just coming to pick me up, literally, and put me in the bag. So as I laid in the bag, and this is true, it's in the book, this part is true. I'll never forget this. I'm laying in the helicopter, I'm broken up the middle, pelvis. I was alert for the whole thing when I got hit. And I even saw my bike, beautiful bike, just tumbling as I was flying through the air. Back's broken, pelvis broken, this hand over like this. And I'm laying, uh, they had to use a sheet to hold me together uh, with pins and stuff because I'm so broken. I'm looking through a little window and I can see the rock in Morro Bay as we're taking off on sunset. And the guy, suddenly I see this phone over my face. He goes, is that you? And I was like, I'm, I'm drumming. <laughs> you know, He's got a clip of the world record playing. He goes, I watched that. And I'm just laying there. I'm like, this is surreal. I'm a broken drummer. I'm just sitting here thinking I'm broken. I'm, this guy's showing me that clip. Part of it was, you know, that's nice. <laughs> but the timing was kind of wrong. And it really summed up the, the surrealness. Within 30 days, I had, you know, the VH1 crew in there. People go on, the doctor said, you're not going to walk again. You're never going to play again. There's just no way. We hope that you'll be able to walk maybe, and if so, without a limp in three years. So I'm sitting there lying to everybody, you know, in traction and so forth. 
But here's the thing I want to put a message out to everyone listening to this. That information was for average people. When they tell you something like that, you have to remember, that is based on average people. You have to then tell yourself, are you average or not? If you want to be average, that is correct. I didn't want to be average. And to this day, when I went back to that hospital a year later and I was walking and I was already starting to play again, most of the people in that hospital intensive care were still there. So you have to, you know, at 9 o'clock at night with one good leg and one good arm and they said I couldn't do a wheelchair, I'd go in circles. I was doing laps, all right. I was doing circles on the whole floor at 9 o'clock every night. I was going one leg, one arm, over and over again, body casting the rest of me because I didn't want to be there. The bed's a dangerous place, and if you don't get out of it, you will stay there. So in a way, that became a bizarre turn of events because I recorded my first album from a wheelchair, the entire album, every instrument. And uh, I would have never done that. I would never come to, to this day where the sixth album is coming out, according to Grover Beach, the band's back. And um, I'm alive. I'm playing. And then the big thing was, why am I alive? I was kind of pissed. I was like, you know, well, God, why didn't you finish me off? Why did you do that? You know, what good is a broken drummer? I mean, and, and uh, what's to come of this? I was at the peak of a career. Wasn't a great way to die. Well, he, he got hit on his Harley. I was at a peak of a career. Good time to go. It would have been great, great ending to a book. But they didn't let me go. Instead, I'm practically paralyzed in a bed. I thought that was the cruelest joke ever. But here's what's happened. Now I've created a you know, little organization that's getting bigger called Music House Call. It's going to help these kids with autism. And I didn't seek to do that out. It literally came to me. It fell in my lap. That's why I'm alive. That's why I'm still here. And these other things all just feed into that. That's all it is. And so then it finally came to me. And then when I got that, now I'm not mad anymore. Now I get it. So you got a whole new uh, mission, right? It came full circle. Yeah. I was that 10-year-old kid getting the trumpet, remember? And it got put on the drums and wasn't put on Ritalin. Now I'm the instructor that's helping your kid not get on Ritalin, Folkland, or whatever drug that they want to put them on after a 45-minute diagnosis for the rest of their life. We need to rethink that. I know some of these children do need these things, but not all of them. And, and I know I just came that full circle. That's how I work. I just pulled that full circle because that's exactly, I think, why I'm here. And you, and you give lessons and, and help them get instruments? And I do. I never wanted to be an instructor because I was actually in the belief system uh, of the Woody Allen line. You know, those that teach can't do. You know, he's got that whole quote. I won't go into it. But, you know, the ones that teach are the ones that actually can't do what they're teaching. But here's how I look at my position. Um, I thought about that quote, and I come up with it this way. A lot of these kids that I deal with, um, did not perform well in regular school systems or even music programs. Some of them have been kicked out. When they see me, it's almost like a Scooby-Doo effect. They do this kind of row, row. You know, they just look at me. I don't have any issue with them. As soon as I walk in, I capture the room. I capture them. And I, I even myself was wondering, why is that? Why are they not messing with me? And then I figured it out. If you are young and you want to go to the moon, what we do currently is we put you in front of a science teacher. But what I am, and what these guys figured out, that if you want to go to the moon, talk to an astronaut. I'm the astronaut. And you want to listen to the astronaut because he's been to the moon. So that's the whole difference. So when you have that kind of background, and you can bring that to the table, and you've got a kid that's wild, and then all of a sudden the astronaut walks in, and they're like, they get quiet. Astronaut. <laughs> Be an astronaut. <laughs> what's, uh, what's some of the cool success stories or, or inspiring things that you've seen come out of giving uh, a child and a student who that extra attention that they might not get somewhere else? Yeah, there's been so many. Uh, two I'll bring up. One recent, not a special specialty child in this case, but uh, we, I just did a show where I featured a bunch of these children playing for the first time on a stage. It was great. Full house, all these parents. You know, back in my day, you did what was called recitals and uh, very stressful, and or uh, if you were lucky to even do that, you know, it was just kind of unusual events. We were in a real venue, real stage. These kids were jammed, you know, just totally just, yeah, you know, playing loud. And that's the way it should be, and they were just so turned on. But one of the uh, children got to play with their father for the first time ever. It was so cool. The smiles on their, the two of their faces 
throughout the entire event, I, it would melt you. It was just amazing. That was one. But one of my favorites, I used to work with the Salvation Army a couple years ago. And this one child didn't speak. Never spoke a word. He just spoke in sounds. It clicks and sounds. A little, little, little guy. And he came in one day, and, I, you know, and I'm talking to him, and I teach him drums. And one day, uh, I looked at him, and I said, you know, I happened to be going to a recording studio that day. And I go, I'm talking to him, talking to him, and he's doing all this fidgeting and his sounds. And I go, hey, would you like to go to the recording studio with me and see what a recording studio's like? And he goes, yes. <laughs> First word he ever said, yes. Parents couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. That's the, that's the magic right there, you see. That was music. That's inspiring. And that in any element is huge, huge. Simple but huge. Where um, uh, you mentioned um, uh, instrument program you're getting together, or is that working on it? That's a that's a work in process. Yeah, part of what I was going to do before I got injured was that was back in 2011. I'm finally back to it. We have these baby boomers. We have these instruments, and as my friends have begun passing away, unfortunately, and some great musicians way too early, um, they're leaving instruments behind. And some of these instruments are ones that they never even play. They're in attics. They're on walls. What happens, what I found, is when you go to these people as a friend or whoever's assigned to this, the stuff just gets given away, liquidated. The things you thought had value that people would want, they don't. Because everyone's got too much stuff. And they can't handle your stuff. So these instruments are going to places that they are not getting the use or attention they could. So I call it keep the music alive. We could take... These instruments, if it's a high-valued one, liquidate it, auction it, and buy 10 more guitars, and then give those guitars away. Give them away to these kids to learn on. What if they don't stick with it? Then they give it away. Okay, that's the idea. There's no money loss here. It's an instrument that's out there. It gives the instrument a chance, too, by the way. The instrument's not being played. What good is an instrument not being played? I know they're beautiful, look great on the wall, but they sound so much better and look so much better when they're being played. So on top of that, the, the whole program is going along that uh, idea. And um, it's under my music house call. It's going to call Keep the Music Alive. I just had a meeting last week with David. We talked about this. And look for that soon. Uh, that's going to be a, a kind of a passion project on, on the side coming up. So uh, Keep the Music Alive? Alan. Yeah, I've, I've used that hashtag for a while. But now it'll actually have a really good purpose. <laughs> so, and it's not going to just be, you know, it's all instruments. Um, you know, my dream is to one day have a warehouse, the Willy Wonka version of uh, instruments where children of need or who don't have the funds that they could walk into and see that guitar. Can you imagine if you were that kid? Oh, my gosh. And, and have you ever seen? I know I was that child when you, when you touched an instrument for the first time and you saw that certain guitar or even piano and you touched it. I used to touch my drums. I used to crest the bass drum. I was like, it's so beautiful. Uh, you know, that's not, a, if you're an artist and, or a musician right now hearing that, that doesn't sound weird to you. And it's those children that would walk into this place and walk out with an instrument. Huge. Um, so you got your music Alex call instructions. You got your keeping music alive instrument program. You got your <laughs> new the album desk. coming out. <laughs> it's this desk. <laughs> yeah. Lead DJ for Kramer events. I've been doing yeah, the DJ oh, thing now, which is. That. Got to be hip and be current, right? Got to be a DJ, too. Yeah, I mean, it's a, th here's the theme across all of my stuff, though. There's one theme, music. There's music in every aspect of everything I do. The marathon, the DJing, the, the recording, and the new album coming out, uh, working with kids. It's music. So that this thing that you can't survive or live on a music program or that artists cannot survive is false. It's a matter of having the desire to, one, yes, perhaps live less beneath your means you know, than you want to, but it's possible. The, the result of that is you're rich in freedom and you're rich in what you do. A lot of people say, gosh, Lou, you look young for your age. I didn't give the number, but if you look it up, the reason I look this way, I'm not this older, balding, overweight guy is because I'm happy. And that's, what, that's success to life because if you're dying at an early age, but, and you worked your butt off your whole life for a bunch of stuff, what good was it? And that's my point. So do what you love. That was true. Don't give up. 
And like my friends who played one kind of music their whole life, we were talking about that earlier off mic, that are touring in other countries right now, there's something, your music has a place somewhere. It lives somewhere. You just got to find the home. So don't give up. Don't think that people don't like way, what you're playing. There, there's something for everybody. It's just like art on a wall. You know, what, somebody says, oh, that's terrible pop art. Someone else comes in and goes, I must have it. That's the way it works. Where can people go to, to stay up to date on Lumar's band, your book, Beat Alive? And Probably the, the central site would be the lumarsband.com. Even though the band is evolving to be Lou Mars and Fourth Planet, we're coming up with a second branding, Fourth Planet for the band. So that way you know when an album is just me and you know when it's actually the band. But the LouMarsBand.com site will usually tell you how to get to everywhere else. LouMarsBooks.com for the new book. That's still development, but you can get a little sneak peek when you go there. And uh, you can find me on all social media. If you just Google my name, L-O-U space M-A-R-S. And I was Mars before Bruno, by the way. <laughs> so, and I was raised in the Philippine Islands. <laughs> I believe he's Filipino. So uh, yeah, there's some, I got a lot of that, but too late to change my name. Yeah. Too late. <laughs> uh, I bring up synchronicity. One interesting one I, I thought as part of, part of the albums that I think you mentioned that you did some of the recording from the, the wheelchair to yeah, the wheelchair yeah. was uh, one called Phoenix Ashes? Or Phoenix, Ashes? Phoenix Ashes and Broken. Uh, broken, literally. I was broken when I recorded that album. That was not a joke. Although a lot of that album is about child abuse. A lot of people don't know that. There are clues in all my album covers. Uh, within the album cover and within the songs, um, I'm one of those fans. I'm a huge Radiohead fan, for example. And I love the way they do that. And, and also Bowie. Love Bowie. And I've emulated and been inspired by a lot of the little secret things they do in their albums and songs. I follow that same path. I love that. Yeah, there's so many amazing stories that, that I've, um, appreciate you sharing with me. But Absolutely. especially that, that Phoenix Ashes. Um, and my old band was Ashes to Light, and now we're doing Phoenix Rising Studios. And it's like, that is awesome. There's, there's, no, there's no coincidence that we're all... You know, it's funny. The similar message. Well, you and I are talking together. Uh, a musician from Los Angeles. Matter of fact, his card, I think, is up in here. Let me get his name real quick so I can give him a plug. These guys, he gets a hold of me, and he just, their band wrote a song about me. <laughs> his band's got Mars in the name. Let me get this up real quick. Here he is. So he comes up here. He's recording up in San Francisco. Plays a song where they mention my name in the song. He said, I had to get a hold of you. Ha. Huh. Name of the band, Going to Mars. <laughs> he, he says, I was coming across, I listened to your music, and I just had, and, and it's just where, it's, my point is, yeah, we're all together, so they, they give us way, the universe gives us way to find each other yep. sometimes. Yep. Same thing, he's doing the same thing. Yeah, so, appreciate that. Yeah, it's wonderful. Right on. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with me and, and give us your story, Lou. Anytime, um, yeah. So Thank Lou's, you. LouMarsBand.com, LouMarsBooks.com. Yep, absolutely. And we'll stay up to date with your, you. your new book coming out, Beat Alive. Yep. And all the other fun Album Album number six. Album number six. Uh, I think the title of that one is The Singles, and it might be under what's called Madness, but I might remove Madness. <laughs> I'm over that now. <laughs> Well, definitely keep us posted, and we'll, we'll, we'll do a follow-up when we get that stuff coming out. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for taking you. the time. What you do makes a difference.